the diversity of all these talks today. It's, it's truly amazing. And I'm not going to make it any better. I'm going to push the envelope. And I think I'm going to violate a bunch of assumptions. I should have Jennifer wire me up here. Um, and so you can tell when I'm telling the truth. Um, anyway, I'm going to be talking about uh, an alternative view of how to implement some of these machine learning algorithms. So, Not working. Can I get some help here? Okay, well, I guess you could, is that working? All right, thanks. Okay, so let's go back to basics. So why do we run Spark? We run Spark because we want to get better performance in memory. We want to be able to run huge, uh, huge problems, huge analytics. Nope, back please. Yeah. On clusters of commodity servers. Commodity means cheap. Uh, we want to enjoy the economies of scale out, economy, cheap. And we want to be, we want to make it really easy. So we want this extra rich set of, thank you, of transformations and actions. We want to operate out of memory as much as possible because memory is fast. So the conundrum that I've seen, I was the chief scientist at SAP and done a number of startups before that. I flunked retirement three times. So um, People tailor their applications to their computing environment. We think that's backwards. We want to tailor the computing environment to the needs of the application. So eventually, people run out of capacity in the computing environment they're in, and they're faced with this, what I call, conundrum for enterprise software. They have to either scale out or they have to scale up. So if you're interested in simplicity, the simplest thing to do is buy a larger computer, right? Uh, but you know, if you decide to scale out, and scale out means MapReduce, Hadoop, uh, SQL, distributed SQL, and so forth, uh, if you want to scale out, it's certainly not going to be simple. You have to recharge your data. You have to rewrite your application. It takes a lot of work. You might introduce bugs. If you're interested mostly in minimizing your hardware costs, you don't want to scale up because these supercomputers get to be very expensive. You're talking about high-density processors, high den lots of cores per chip. You're talking about high-density memories. All that cost adds up. So if you're interested in hardware costs, what you really want to do is scale out. But you've got a problem. So what do you do? And you can now predict what I'm about to say. What I'm going to say is you want the simplicity of scale up with the hardware cost advantages of scale out. So can we do that? Yes, we can do that. Now, as I say here, it's very easy for me to say this. I have to say it's ridiculously hard to do. Okay? What we do is we aggregate a number of commodity servers and make it look like a supercomputer. And it's easy to say, very hard to do. Why? Because we have to use a lot of processors and we have to maintain a flat, coherent, shared memory space. If, you, if it's going to look like a von Neumann architecture, we've got to make it look like a von Neumann architecture, which means that shared memory better be strongly coherent. So the key takeaways, this is my conclusion from this talk, actually. We want the simplicity of scale up, okay? Um, you want to be able to run multiple terabytes, multiple, multiple terabyte analytics on a single Spark node. That's what we want. And the scale out that's going to happen, we're going to take care of for you. It's going to be under the hood. You're not going to see it. You're not going to have to do anything. It's just going to look like a massively large single computer running a single operating system. Now, the programming paradigm that you're all accustomed to, or you should be accustomed to, is you're going to, you're going to interact with RDD. You're going to do parallel in-memory execution. You're going to have lazy repeatable evaluations. And you're going to have a rich set of operators. So that's, that's fine. That's all well and good. That's why you're using Spark. 
Uh, the problem is the plumbing underneath that. To do that plumbing requires a lot of very specific uh, tools and techniques. It's not easy. Our alternative to this is the same programming paradigm, but let Tidal Scale take care of all the plumbing. And we take care of all the plumbing by creating this layer of software that actually sits below the operating system. Okay. And the operating systems that we support, CentOS 6.5, 6.6, 6.7, Red Hat, FreeBSD, and Windows. So we have to look like hardware. And we have looked like hardware for the last 18 months. We run the Linux test procedures, which is what the procedures all the server guys use when they build their hardware. And we have to pass all those tests at 100%. And we've been doing it for 18 months. So here is a Spark cluster with multiple nodes. You have a master node, and you have a bunch of worker nodes. Uh, the same holds true, by the way, for lots of other programming technologies. Uh, you'll see the same thing uh, anytime you go to do a scale out. Um, <clears throat> so. What we do instead, we build, we build a small piece of software called a hyperkernel. You wouldn't be too far off to think of that hyperkernel as an extremely smart BIOS. Okay? Now, normally an operating system has this intimate relationship between the hardware and the operating system. And it's quite intimate. So the operating system thinks it's running on hardware, and the hardware thinks it's running on operating system. And we have to do exactly the same thing. So when the when this cluster powers on, okay, each of these hyperkernels inventories all of the resources on each node, how many processors, how much memory, how, much, how many disks, how many disk controllers, how many ethernets, and um, then they talk amongst each other, and they build an overall aggregated table, okay, and it's, that table is just the sum of all the resources of all the systems in the cluster. And then one of them, and it doesn't matter which one, because uh, there's no central controller here. It's completely distributed. It's all peer-to-peer. -peer. One of them is elected to boot an operating system. And the operating system just starts running. In effect, we fed the operating system a complete pack of lies. We said it has lots and lots of processors, and yet each node doesn't have lots and lots of processors. It has a fixed amount. Same thing for memory, same thing for disk, and so forth. So what happens when those assumptions are violated. So let's say all the way on the left, you have a core accessing some memory that's all the way on the right. Well, Intel and AMD and others have put virtualization features in the chips for the last 10 years. That's what the uh, virtual machine technology has been using to accelerate performance. We use the same thing, only we use it in a very different way. So what happens is a machine fault is generated if these fundamental assumptions are violated then we can either move the memory to where the processor is that requested that memory, or we move the processor to where the memory is. What, in effect, we're doing is building on work that was originally originated in 1968 with Peter Denning. He developed this concept of working sets. We've generated, we've generalized this concept of working sets to include not only memory, but processors, disks, I.O., everything, interrupts everything. So um, how we fix it up, uh, I don't have time today to, to actually uh, go through that with you, but if you want to catch me after during the break, we can talk about it some more. So what are we doing here exactly? <clears throat> so what I'm proposing here is that you have the ability to have a super node. And if you have the ability to do a super node, you don't need a lot of the other stuff. Instead of using TCP IP across the network, we're using a dedicated 10 gig Ethernet to communicate amongst all the nodes. And that Ethernet is invisible to the guest operating system. That Ethernet is an acknowledged low-level transport, similar to the way you'd use a memory bus on a motherboard. The OS doesn't know anything about the memory bus. The OS doesn't know anything about the 10 gig Ethernet. When you go to scale out, the way we scale out is you just add another server and you reboot the cluster. And you do that a little differently, of course, in, in Spark. Uh, so to scale up looks like uh, you're just creating a bigger computer. Hence my earlier comment, um, 
you build the bigger computer to fit the application. And you do that over time. You can start small, and as your data requirements grow, you add more servers. So a lot of the large capital equipment expense you might have to have in building a massive computer, you don't have to have. And when you're not using it for Spark, you can use it for anything else you want. Um, it just looks like Linux. I know that's hard to believe, but people are amazed. You just come in and you, all of a sudden you have a four terabyte computer. And all the standard commands you're use, used to just work. So to prove the point, we went and looked at uh, some numbers and ran some experiments. I'm not going to, you don't have to go through all this because it's summarized on the next slide. But we use the synth, synth benchmark. And in this benchmark, we had, a, 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 we ran it on EC2, okay? And we ran a 28 gig master node and five, let's see, one, yeah, five 28 gig fairly small virtual machines on EC2. And we compared those results with a tidal scale cluster with about the same amount of memory, therefore about the same cost. Um, and what I want to do is show you the results of that. So we ran four experiments, A, B, C, and D. We ran small nodes on EC2, that was A. We ran a larger one on EC2. We used half the number of nodes, but each node was larger. And then we ran a C and D. C corresponds to B, okay? And then just for jollies, we pumped it up, we bumped it all up. So let me show you the results. Results are A, and this is a log scale, by the way. Actually, it's a log log scale. So higher is slower, okay? So B outperforms A, use larger nodes, you get better results. But now what happens when you use tidal scale? That's C, okay? C is about the same hardware configuration of B, and it performs about the same. But now, when you scale up, D is actually better. So we're running a much larger load on this, and again, you didn't have to do anything differently. It just ran. What we found was that tuning Spark is very complex. We're not Spark experts. So what we found was that, you know, small changes in the configuration result in very large changes in performance. Uh, and we're not sure we did it right on either EC2 or on tidal scale because we're not Spark experts. But what I can tell you is we try to use the same configurations on both. Um, and the number of data partitions, you may already know this, but it can have a huge uh, performance effect on, on the results. Another thing that's possible to do is you can have a a large master node and smaller worker nodes. And we saw this a lot at uh, SAP when we were doing in-memory SQL databases. So you take the subqueries and you send them out on the network, and then you do a massive join, typically on node zero, and that node zero would keel over and die. Okay, it just back to life. So mixed mode here is definitely possible. So in terms of our uh, Conclusions and recommendations. Spark standalone on tidal scale performs similarly to a cluster. With tidal scale, you can have much larger workloads and you can run out of memory. Run, that's a bad way of phrasing it, isn't it? You run the data out of memory. You don't run out of memory. You don't run the data out of memory without having to tune your Spark application. And we recommend that you can use both scale up and scale out. So the key message, new class of virtual supercomputers to host Spark. You can run multi-terabyte analytics on a single Spark node. A little hard to see the screen from here. Our value proposition hasn't changed in three years since we started the company. The first thing is you can scale up dynamically and at linear hardware cost. You don't have to use supercomputers. You can run very, very large memories. To give you an example, we have three customer-facing systems right now. Our cust they're, they're in use all the time. Um, trust me, I sound like Donald Trump. Uh, uh, each of the last two systems we built has 120, pro 120 cores, 3.8 terabytes of memory, 20 solid-state disks, 
whole bunches of ethernets and the total cost is seventy thousand dollars just if anybody's bought hardware that's you're buying a supercomputer for seventy thousand dollars with tax in Santa Clara California it's seventy five thousand and we simplify the whole process because you don't have to do anything you're getting one massive Linux system We do all the optimizations under the covers. We map the virtual processors and the virtual memory to the physical processors and the physical memory in microseconds on a demand basis. And it all depends not on what the programmer thinks is going on, but what's really going on. We can move a page in under 100 microseconds across a 10 gig ethernet. And by the way, if you're wondering, do we ever load, overload that Ethernet? Not even close. We actually use four port 10 gig E cards for a total of 40 gigabits per second on each of these nodes. We only hook up one of the four, and a few months ago we got around to measuring it, and we're using 5% utilization. So how can that be, you say to yourself? Well, I said, if we're building working sets and all of the processors that need to be together are together along with all the memory they need, then the system is running at speed. There's no traffic on the interconnect whatsoever. So the optimization part is really crucial and that's really where our secret sauce is. Figuring out using coincidentally machine learning techniques, I didn't want to confuse it, but we're talking about running machine learning and using machine learning, two different layers. But that's what we do. Whenever we get a machine fault, we go through an evaluation of what that meant, what the history was, and what the ideal situation is, what we should do next. Should we move the memory to the processor? Should we move the processor to the memory? If it's a non-local I.O., do we move the processor to where the I.O. device is, or do we remote the I.O.? Obviously, the software can't literally move a, uh, an I.O. device, but we can remote the I.O. operation. And finally, this is all software. Any Intel processor in the last 10 years has all the features we need to do this. So as the hardware gets better, we get better. And I see I have five minutes left, but that's my last slide. If you have any questions, go to tidalscale.com or catch me during the break. Thank you.